Gonna let me put your hands together, start the clapping, cheering. Please welcome on stage, Mike Cox. How are we all right? How are we enjoying the British summertime? Yeah, it's fucking lovely, isn't it? You've got shorts on, you are clearly loving it. Could rain at any minute, we know that. We're prepared for it, it's what British summertime is. Favourite time of year, my least favourite time of year, because that's the thing about British weather, you get two types of weather at any given point. You can't have the sun without the rain. The annoying thing is springtime, right? Because springtime is one of those annoying times of the year where if you get up about 11 o'clock, you can look out your window and think, Sunny, I'm going to put a t-shirt and shorts on. If you're not back in your house by 4 p.m., you will die. <laughs> it's, it's like, you missed everyone else that morning scraping ice off their motor. <laughs> That's the annoying time of year. It's an annoying time of year. It's hard to prepare for it properly, isn't it? You check the weather. When you've got ice in mornings, you check. Weather app will tell you, so tomorrow morning the temperature will be minus 3. But it will feel like minus 11. If that's what it feels like, mate, that's the only fucking one it is, isn't it? <laughs> You've just given me two temperatures, one of which you know it ain't going to feel like. <laughs> it's annoying. It's dangerous, if anything. What if you're not listening properly? What if you just hear the first temperature, you grab a minus three jacket, go out, freeze to death. It's annoying. It's annoying because what they do is their job is to give you information. So what they do is they give you some information. It's vague. It'll be something in between. It won't be what they've said and you'll accept it. How many times have you ever gone out, the weather wasn't what they said, if you phone up to complain? <laughs> Has anyone ever thought, I'm going to do some washing today and then you don't do your washing because they told you it was going to rain and then it didn't? <laughs> now you're a day behind. <laughs> anyone ever complained about that? No. No one has. So what they've happened across is a clever way of when you ask something, you give an answer, it doesn't matter what it is, can't touch her. <laughs> so I've started using it in my life now. My wife says to me, what time are you going to be home? I said, I'll be home by half nine, baby, it will feel more like half one. <laughs> That's <what I> do. <laughs> I mean, I would if I had the bollocks to actually try that. You know what I mean? <laughs> But you could use it on other people, couldn't you? I imagine most of you got jobs and there's somebody at your job is irritates you, the type of person that will try to talk to you before half 10, 11 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you got the type of person, they'll come up to you first thing on a Monday, that's too soon. They'll go, you, you wouldn't believe the weekend I've had, mate. It's been crazy, it's been pure banter. <laughs> and you could go, oh, I'd love to hear all about it, Daryl, but it will feel like I couldn't give a fuck, mate. <laughs> Don't care. Don't care. So Cameron was just mentioned losing weight. I've lost about three stone recently. So I, and to show off, I did it by accident. And when I say by accident, what I mean is my wife went on Slimming World. Yeah, just her. And it soon became my fucking problem, mate. I lost weight like that. I'll tell you why. There was nothing in my house I could eat. Every time I went to the fridge to get something out, what's this? Avocado. I'm not eating that. That is a pear made of crayon. Some lentils, not eating those. <laughs> lentils are not food. Anybody who went to a British primary school knows they're arts and crafts. <laughs> they belong in a category with PVA glue and glitter. <laughs> which are two things I'd eat before a fucking lentil. I will swear by this, though, if you're a big snacker like me, if you like to eat a lot of snacks, get yourself kale crisps. I've got a cupboard full of them. Every time I feel snacky, I go to the cupboard, I see the kale crisps, and realise I'm nowhere near as hungry as you fucking need to be. <laughs> it's hard work being healthy. It's hard work being healthy, isn't it? Like, I find it hard to say no to food when it's in front of me. Like, if you've got willpower, then credit to you. I saw something once that blew my mind. Right? I was on a train, and I watched a guy opposite me eat half a Snickers. <laughs> Just half. He wrapped the other half up, put it in his bag for later. 
What sort of expert level willpower bullshit is that? <laughs> I couldn't do that. If I wanted Snickers now and Snickers later, I'm going to need two fucking Snickers. <laughs> That's right. So anyway, I got into I got into the losing weight, and I thought well, it's actually working. Slimming world actually works, like it did for me anyway. So I joined up one of these support groups, right? And then there's loads of people being weird. And I saw something weird on this group, right? One of the girls on there said, "I can't, can't believe I haven't lost weight. I've been following this diet religiously." I thought, well, that's your problem. Like the, she's used the word religiously. I followed it religiously in its original term. And the original term would be if you follow something religiously, it's because you followed it to the nth degree, to the finest detail, right? But that's not how every single religious person I've ever met has lived their life. So basically, to do something religiously like a diet, what you've basically done is, when asked, you said you were on a diet, but nothing about your life has suggested that you are on a diet. <laughs> You're probably aware that there is a book. You don't own it. All you know is that every now and again you can have a cheat day. <laughs> Slimming World is a little bit like being religious, I suppose. It's like... You pretend you're not on it seven days a week, and then the seventh day comes, you meet up in a church, all pray for a fucking miracle. <laughs> Somebody at the front of the room judges you, and then you have some wine and bread after. That's what it's like. <laughs> I mean, it might sound like there I'm having a pop at religious people. <laughs> I'm not. If you want to pray, that is up to you. It doesn't affect me. At the end of the day, it's your own time you're wasting. Still, some people I can still feel a little bit of tension. You think I'm trying to be a fan? I'm not. I'm not. I would never go out of my way to be offensive about religious people. I went to a Catholic high school, right? And I failed science because I thought it's what they would have wanted. <laughs> I'll extend an olive branch, right? Uh, I've got a little list of people that annoy me the most, and they're not even on it, right? Um, top of the list at the moment, anyone who gets married abroad. Just selfish pricks, mate. <laughs> I'm sick of getting that invitation to go, oh, they're getting married. Oh, fuck off, mate. <laughs> You've got to decide whether you're going to save up, go, or just never see these self-indulgent cunts again. <laughs> it's annoying, isn't it? Because what they do, if you, like, what they've they're basically asking you to do is use five days of your very finite annual leave on something they could have wrapped up in an afternoon. And if you ask them why, they'll go, oh, it was cheap. Cheap for you. I'm 1,500 quid down on a holiday I don't want to be on. <laughs> so annoying. And they're, they're liars, right? There is only one reason why anyone gets married abroad, isn't there? One. It's because there's a, somebody in their family they hate and they're trying to price them out. And listen, you're out of pocket, and your leave's fucked because your mate can't tell his uncle Dave he's a cock. <laughs> <laughs> uncle Dave over there, is it? <laughs> I always go, though. I always make sure I save up and go, you know, just in case I am the arsehole they're trying to price out. <laughs> <sighs> World is full of arseholes, though, isn't it? You think so? Do you think there's a lot more idiots than there ever used to be? Yeah. I think there is. I know why as well. Because of health and safety. <laughs> Isn't it? Health and safety has ensured the survival of dickheads. <laughs> Isn't it? Now there's a bunch of people running around that should be dead. <laughs> They're out there putting their opinions on Twitter, getting jobs and that. That's what they're doing. I bumped into an idiot with a job, right? I went on holiday, and I'm going and checking in at the airport. I'm checking in my luggage, and there was one of these idiots with a job asking stupid questions, right? And they asked this question. And this is a question that gets asked at the airport and is probably relevant 99% of the time, but it wasn't relevant now. She said to me, did you pack your bag yourself, sir? <laughs> yeah. This is a 5.30 a.m. Ryanair flight to Tenerife, mate. <laughs> what part of any of that suggests to you that I have staff? human race is fucked. It's <laughs> fucked. I have decided, though, I have decided that women are better than men. 
Live like that. No. <laughs> That's not name calling, that is an accurate description of what you're going to be doing in about four hours. <laughs> they are, and I can prove it to you, right? You say boo, but I'll prove it to you. I've lived with my wife for 12 years, and I've lived with blokes before, and I know that women are better than men, and I know this from living with a woman. Because I know if my wife holds something up and asks me to sniff it, chances are it smells nice. I'm so confident of that fact that sometimes I don't even look. <laughs> like, oh, that's lovely. Was that a Yankee candle? Yeah, it will be. It will be a Yankee candle. <laughs> and you can trust that. But if you know, if you've lived with blokes, you cannot take that gamble. <laughs> so I like her. I took my wife to, uh, we've had our anniversary recently. I took her to Harrods for afternoon tea because that's what she wanted to do. You ever done that? No. Don't. I ruined it for her, she said. Because it was so expensive, I basically had a go at her for leaving a tiny bit of scone and I priced up the whole thing. <laughs> I basically went, that is about seven pounds worth of scone there. That sultana is about four quid, get it, it. <laughs> she goes, I don't know why you can't just enjoy it. Why do you have to be such a dickhead? Why can't you just enjoy it for what it is? It's expensive because it's the experience. You're paying for the service and the attention. And I thought, that's not why that guy keeps putting hot water in that teapot. He keeps putting hot water in that teapot so I don't fucking steal it. That's how you know women are better than men with dicks. I think you could tell from a really young age as well that like girls are smarter than boys. They are, right? And I could show you. I, why has it gone quiet? It fucking is, right? <laughs> I've got a little boy and he's two, right? And all of my wife's like, mum friends have all had little girls. And I watch them play together. And you see the little girls, right? And they come around and they're playing in our house. They get the little tea set out. And they're pouring each other tea and they're drinking it. And I look in the room and I see my little boy, he's at the back of the room licking a fucking radiator. <laughs> I remember the first time I see him do it, I said to the wife, I said, he's in here licking the radiator. She goes, well, is it turned on? I said, it's hard to tell, but he's enjoying it. It's hard being a parent, isn't it? Have we got any parents of young children in? Yeah. It's fucking hard, isn't it? <laughs> like, it's hard, because like, I remember going up to my mum and dad with problems, right? And you give them the, like, you ask them a question, they gave you an answer, and you're like, they know everything. They know everything. It's only when you're a kid, you, uh, when you've got kids yourself, you realise they were making it up as they go along. <laughs> you are literally lucky to be alive. That's what it's like. Because all you've got to do as a parent, you've essentially just got to try and find a way that works for you, haven't you? Like, what works for someone else might not necessarily work for you, and vice versa. Um, you just got to work things out. And I'll give an example of something I had to work out for myself, right? I kept having this problem where as soon as my little boy became mobile, it would take me forever to get him to bed. Like from the bath, I would take him into his room and I'd lay a little mat and towel out on the floor, right? And this is where I'd put his uh, nappy and his pajamas on getting ready for bed. But as soon as he was mobile, as soon as he touched the floor, he'd go <laughs> <laughs> And he'd like disappear in the corner. I'd have to grab him by his toe and drag him back over. And then I try and put a nappy on, and as soon as I've let go to reach for his pyjamas, he's like, <laughs> he's gone. He's trying to get back in the bath, he's trying to go downstairs, trying to get the keys and fuck off out. It was a nightmare, right? <laughs> it was taking me forever, like, so I had to come up with a way of trying to do it quickly, right? So what I'd done is when I'd got him out the bath, I'd put him down on the mat, and then I'd kneel on him. And when I say parent in his trial and error, I didn't get that right first time. Like, <laughs> first time, very low, sick, right? <laughs> Second time, too high, went blue, right? <laughs> Third time, found a sweet spot, nice. So he was pinned, <laughs> he was pinned, but there was still quite a lot of upper pivot, right? <laughs> so to combat that, I used my left leg, and I stand on his hand, right? <laughs> so he's wedged down now. That would leave my two hands free to go about my business, get him in his cot and get the fuck out of there, right? <laughs> and when I tell people that's how I did it, you get two reactions, right? You get the first reaction, those are parents, they go, <laughs> hey, fucking well done you, mate, well done. <laughs> and then you get another reaction, which is this one. <laughs> I'm gonna report you. 
I find those are normally people that have never had to dress a kid before. <laughs> so I always say to those people, before you get like too judgmental and you report people, what you need to do is you need to understand what it is like, right, for the rest of us who had to dress a kid. And if you want to understand, this is what you need to do. At some point over the weekend, go out and try and catch a squirrel. <laughs> and if you get one, try and put fucking clothes on it. <laughs> it's hard work, isn't it? My little boy, he, came, he turned about two, it was. It was at Christmas, he turned two. And uh, that was the moment I think he looked at me and thought, I'm going to fucking break that mental health you like so much. <laughs> he started pranking me in public on purpose, right? First thing that happened, I have my little boy on Thursdays. We go out together, just me and him, right? And I don't know if you dads have ever gone out with your little boy or little girl alone, right? But there's always this moment when you're walking them back to the car holding hands that people look because there's a little bit of trust in people's minds. Because you're thinking, why is he not at work? <laughs> I'm just going to keep an eye on this, make sure that kid goes in a seat and not the boot. <laughs> right? There's a pressure on you as a dad, right? So I get the little boy to the car. He doesn't want to get in a seat. He does the thing that toddlers do where they suddenly go, solid liquid, solid liquid. <laughs> And I'm trying to get him in this seat, but I'm trying not to have everyone think I'm punching a kid into the back of my car. Right? <laughs> so I'm wrestling with him in this seat, and out of nowhere, I've never heard him do this ever, he went, help, help! <laughs> I was like, get in, we need to get the fuck out of here! <laughs> Another time, right, this is a time I thought, that, I thought that was maybe just a fluke, this is when I fucking knew he was a prick, right? <laughs> Where I live, there's an open-air shopping centre, right? And I took him there again on a Thursday, just me and him, we're out. And as soon as we get into the shopping centre, right, there's a little train that goes round and you can pay to go on it. And he sees it, he goes, choo-choo, daddy, choo-choo. I said, yeah, we'll get on this train, mate. So we do the shopping and then we go to this little makeshift platform that they've got. And we wait for the train to pull up, pay the geezer the 700,000 fucking quid he wants to get on this thing. <laughs> and we sit in the carriage, right? Now, me and my boy are the only ones who get on this train. So, guy gets fed up of waiting, he goes, choo choo, we pull away, right? As soon as we pull away and we're committed, he slides down into the bottom of the carriage where no one else can see him. And that's where he stayed for a full 20 minute figure of eight <laughs> around a packed shopping centre at Christmas. <laughs> I could actually see other adults and parents going, have you seen this guy on this train? <laughs> the state of him. <laughs> I had to ride that out for 20 minutes, just sitting there going, <laughs> all right, everyone, oh, all right, yeah, oh, fair enough, all right, yeah. There was no way it was going to be any better for me at any point to try and explain or justify myself. I'm going, don't worry, everyone, I've got a little boy down here. <laughs> oh. oh, you guys have been lovely to talk to. Do you guys get people phoning you up asking if you've been in car accidents? Yeah. I used to get that a lot, right? I used to get that probably two or three times a week. And then one week, I just did what a lot of people do, and I started messing with them down the phone, right? I did three in a row, never had another phone call since. I think they've actually blocked me, right? <laughs> I just started winding them up like a lot of people do. They phoned me up. They said, Mr. Cox, have you been in an accident? I said, yes, I have, mate. That threw him. <laughs> I said, but I want to know how you know. He said, well, I've got it on my screen here. I said, well, you shouldn't because there are only two of us in that crash. <laughs> and when I drove off, <laughs> he was definitely dead. <laughs> That'll get you put through to a supervisor like that, right? Second time they phoned, I didn't have a lot of time. I just picked it up. They said, Mr. Cox, have you been in an accident? I said, yes, I have, mate, but there's no point phoning me about this. If he wants to wear a pinstripe suit on a zebra crossing, he gets what's coming to him. 
And then the last time they phoned, this is my finest work, never had another phone call after this fight. They just said, Mr. Cox, have you been in an accident? I just went, fuck, that was quick. <laughs> They've not even cut me out yet. <laughs> right, ladies and gentlemen, the bright loving Mike Cox. See you again sometime. <laughs>